Welcome to today's show on the Ed Boston Podcast Network. We're pleased to be able to bring you an interview. A gentleman by the name of Aaron Edelheit has written a new book, The Heartbreak, the case for the 24-6 lifestyle. The Heartbreak, it examines the need for Sabbath and its benefits mentally, physically, and spiritually. Aaron is going to share some of his personal stories with us and how science is providing what scripture has told us from the very beginning. God himself sets an example on the need for the Sabbath. I think you're going to enjoy this interview today. God bless and we'll be back at the very end. Hi friends and welcome to the Ed Boston Podcast today. Got an interview for us. Aaron Edelheit is with us. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Well, thank you very much for having me. Now, you have a new book out, and it's interesting when uh, your PR person introduced me to this. Uh, I'd been given a lot of thought to how we relate to the Sabbath, and your book, The Heartbreak, The Case for the 24-6 Lifestyle, Tell us about the the thought process behind writing the book. So the first thing I have to admit is that I'm a workaholic (laughs) and that I'm driven in ways that I'm not sure I fully understand. And so half of this book is kind of written to myself as a reminder. Uh, I'm just as addicted to my smartphone as everybody else is. And... um, you know, the, the whole thought process is that uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, I hit a wall where I was working every day and trying to optimize every second and minute. And not only was my personal life suffering, my spiritual life suffering, but also my work life. And kind of out of desperation, I tried uh, turning off for literally four or five hours um, on a Saturday morning, and uh, and it was re- seemed really impossible to try to even do that, which is so ridiculous. Um, and then I, over a couple of months, I finally built it up into a day when I would not work, and my phone was off, and my computer was off. And what I found is that it radically changed, uh, profoundly uh, transformed my life. Uh, from not only my personal life, but my professional life as well. And so I've been doing this for many years. It allowed me to build a company from uh, 16 uh, rental homes to 2,500 and uh, sell the company to a publicly traded real estate investment trust. And, you know, really after I sold that company, I came away watching a lot of different work habits and I realized I really wanted to write a book, making the business case for the Sabbath and really sharing the gift of how it can change your life. It's uh, not a new idea. Actually, it's thousands of years old. Uh, what, what happened to us? How did we get away from the Sabbath? Well, I think that, you know, I think a number of things happened, but I think it actually primarily came from a good place. I think most of us, we want to accomplish, we want to do, we want to make a mark on the world. More importantly, we want to provide for our families, right? We want to, uh, we want to do well in what we're doing. And the initial thought is, well, for us to do well, I need to put in more hours. And now with the introduction of technology, you have an infinite amount of work, or connection. It's not just work, but it's also being connected all the time. And I think that, that what that has has done is it's overwhelming us. And we're not realizing that we weren't made um, to process this information, to be connected all the time. And we're starting to see a breakdown in our health, in our mental health. Um, and we're starting to see destructive work practices as well. So, so what's really remarkable and why I wrote the book is I have 200 footnotes in the book, you know, studies from Harvard and Stanford and the Centers for Disease Control basically sharing just how unbelievably bad 
our current habits are um, and how unproductive they are. And so, you know, I think it started from a good place and has kind of, you know, like many things, the pendulum has swung to an extreme. And so I wanted to write the book because I think that if your pastor comes to you, your friends, your family, and say, hey, you should take a break. You need to create some downtime. Your first reaction, and I know because I was one of these people, but say, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what the modern world is like. You don't know how how hard it is to compete in the world. I have to do this. And so my book is basically a response is, no, you don't. Isn't it always interesting when science, and you mentioned studies, back up what God told us in his word. No, exactly. This is the the coolest thing about my book is, or just the research that I found is, you have a tradition thousands of years old, and then what does the latest neuroscience show us today? Well, it shows us that when you're resting, when you're not working, when you're just reflecting, daydreaming, you think your brain, you're not using your brain, and that it's just in downtime. But that's actually not what happens. There's a part of your brain called the default mode network that actually goes into overdrive. And what does the default mode network do? Well, what it does is it tries to piece together information and experiences, form patterns, and actually gain understanding of what, what, you, what you've experienced um, in the past day or past week. And so they find that the people that have the strongest default mode networks are artists. And so more and more of the, of the jobs in today's economy is about managing information, problem solving, being creative, being innovative, trying to really stand out. And so how do you do that? Well, ironically, it's by resting because you're not giving your chance to your brain the chance to reflect and come up with new ideas. And that's what the Sabbath allows you to do. You think about the proverbial idea in the shower, where you go for a walk and suddenly some solution hits you. Well, that's because your brain is still going, even though you don't think of it. Seven steps to a successful Sabbath. Tell us what that means. So part of the book is, you know, one, I tell my journey, and then I share many, many examples from like Chick-fil-A to many other companies and business leaders who practice the Sabbath in some way, shape, or form, share a bunch of scientific studies and data. But at the end, when I'm, it, it's one thing to go ahead and say, yeah, you know, I, I agree. I, I do need a break. I, but how do you turn off? Like, how, how do you actually do that? And what do you do on the day? Um, and, and, and so I try to give some real practical tips and tools that you can do to actually disconnect and not work. And, you know, one of them is what I recommend, what works for me is not to just jump into a whole day, but to actually take baby steps. Uh, So for me, it started with four or five hours on the morning and then slowly building that up over time. I recommend that you prepare in advance. So let your loved ones know, um, you know, how to get in touch with you, where you're going to be, um, and to really think about, like, if you have jobs, having some backup, or, or really think about preparing for it. Because in today's world, everyone expects to be connected. You know, the funny things that, that I say is um, when, uh, when I make plans on a Sabbath, and I say, oh, well, I'll meet you in this park to have, like, a picnic with our families, or I'll meet you at this restaurant at 1 p.m., and invariably, you know, the first couple times I'll let them know, well, just to let you know, my phone's going to be off, so I'll meet you there at one. And then invariably there's some panic on the other side where they're like, well, what do you mean your phone won't be on? <laughs> and what's so funny is, you know, there used to be a world where you tell people, I'm going to be here at 1 p.m. And they would meet you there at 1 p.m. And if they were late, they were late and, you know, whatever, but you were there. Mm. And now we expect to be in like this constant touch. I'm on my way. I'm running five or 10 minutes late or, you know, all this constant communication. And what's funny is that when I tell people I'm going to be there at 1 p.m., very often they're there at 1 p.m. They know that I'm going to be there. Right. And it's funny you mentioned that because 
I did that very thing last night. My wife and I, we thought we were running a little bit late going to Bible study. I texted the preacher and said, you know, we're running a few minutes late. We ended up getting there two minutes early. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that, I, I can verify you're, you're actually absolutely right there. Part of it is just, you know, th this technology is really this absolutely amazing thing. And it really is a, a wonder. You know, the fact that my grandparents, that my parents can FaceTime or, or Skype uh, with their uh, grandchildren that are thousands of miles away is an absolute gift. But at the same time, like anything, used to an extreme, uh, like there are some real downsides. You mentioned in the book that Americans not only have a hard time with the 24-6, but actually uh, using their vacation days. Yes, yeah, so we we this is astonishing that Americans give up something like six or seven hundred million vacation days a year, and and you know through all my book and I'm just sharing how profoundly important vacations are, and this is the whole idea of the Sabbath is I get a vacation every week, like who doesn't want that? Um, it's amazing, and yet you know. People are giving up their vacations, and when they take vacations, they're taking things called workations, where they're bringing work along. And, uh, you know, the, there's starting to be an understanding that this is not healthy, and this is not good for business. And so, so some enlightened CEOs are actually paying their employees to disconnect on their paid vacations, and they call it paid, paid vacations. You make reference to an unlikely source, the sports world, when it comes to taking a break. How does that work? So there really is, you know, if you're a sports fan, uh, and I am, there really has been a, a revolution in sports in the last, I'd say, 10 to 20 years around data analytics, sports analytics. And it's happened in baseball, it's happened in basketball, it's happened in football, where People are analyzing the data and really not going from their gut. And what they're finding is, and this is the revolution that's happening is, let's look for baseball for a second. It used to be that if you were a pitcher, you were pitching nine innings a game. And then you'd have a couple of days rest and then you go pitch some more. Well, now you're lucky if you're a pitcher and you get to 100 pitches. Because yeah. what they found in the data is after 100 pitches, you, the performance starts to decline. Now you're having specialist peak pitchers come in and um, you know relieve at different you know middle relief and then relief and it's very rare that a pitcher uh, um, completes uh, a, a complete uh, makes a complete game. And even when the Cubs won the World Series, it's almost like a outcry that the reliever hadn't had enough rest. Um, and they, you know, he gave up some runs and went into high strainings and the Cubs almost lost their chance for their first World Series because the manager kind of overused some lightly used pitcher. And it's the same thing in football. You know, a superstar like J.J. Watt uh, sleeps nine to ten hours a day during the season. And it's in, in uh, LeBron James who, uh, you know, is clearly – in my opinion, like the best basketball player in the league right now, um, even though he's losing in this series, is uh, he, he does something called Zero Dark 30, where he goes completely off uh, all social media, all email, all computers during the playoffs. Uh, and Steph Curry, he was on the other side, does something similar. And so what you're finding is that there's intense focus, and the question in sports is not should you rest, but how much rest should you should you get? And it's not just like a little rest, but there's an argument of you're not resting enough because the athletes, the value of the athletes is is very, very high. And they're just realizing that the old kind of sports philosophy of rub some dirt in it. You know, think of like the Bear Bryant. We're going to mm. run and and practice you know in 100 and you know 50 degree heat and uh, 
you know, really, you know, just kill our guys. Now the question is, oh, we might practice with pads on this day because it leads to injury, it leads to mistakes, it leads to exhaustion. And this is part of using data. And so why would we be any different? If anything, because we use our brain, our brain is a muscle, and we need to give it rest just like athletes do. Personally, I am a huge sports fan. I, in the background, I have my St. Louis Cardinal baseball game on uh, with the sound down. <laughs> and, and so everything that you mentioned is is spot on. And they've even had to, especially with pitchers, change the way they evaluate their performances. You know, used to it was the number of wins and the number of innings pitched, uh, all of those different things were what you looked at. And now they have uh, ways of looking at things that I don't even understand. It's so uh, complicated uh, statistically that it's above my my train of thought. And I'm an old school person, kind of like when you were talking about Bear Bryant, not quite that old, but, you know, it's been, well, these young guys, you know, they need to just suck it up. And it's not that they need to suck it up, but the teams have have studied, as you said, and, you know, it's a different game than what it was 15 or 20 years ago. Well, part of it is just the understanding, especially when you get to the star, that the injuries, when someone gets injured or when that the cost to the team is so high, um, and then the exhaustion factor, when a player gets exhausted, that their performance declines, and then, you know, the, the best teams, the, the, whether it's a especially like college football or football, there's so many decisions that they're making split second that their brains need to be very, very sharp because they need to analyze, are they in this setup or that setup? And I need to see what that guy is, you know, in position for. And it's the same thing. It's like the more exhausted you are, the you have one bad decision and there goes the game. Yeah. You have one star player get injured. There's your season. And so I, what, what is a lot of what's driving the change in philosophy is like, well, hey, you know, this is really hurting us when someone makes a bad decision or injuries. And so my argument is you're having this incredible revolution in sports. And why is this not happening in the business world? And, and what do the folks from uh, Chick-fil-A, Hobby Lobby, and others that are using the 24-6 what do they say about the results of that? Well, I mean, the results are very clear. I mean, and I write about Chick-fil-A in my book, and it's just the quintessential example. So Chick-fil-A last year did $9 billion in sales. The average Chick-fil-A grosses four times the revenue of the average KFC, even though KFC is open every day. And it's they are uh, in the next two years. I think they're going to be the number three fast food chain uh, in the country, and the results are just very, very clear. And so, what the Chick Fil A has found, and you know, I interviewed their executives, is that the Sabbath practice actually informs their entire business, and then the the company being off and closed on Sunday is the key to their long term success. And so it's translated into better care for their employees because they want their employees to be home with their families, to have time for a spiritual life. They then realized, hey, we care about our employees. And then learning, hey, you know, most of our employees are seasonal. How about we start providing them with scholarships? So they started providing scholarships that have provided millions of dollars in scholarships for their employees to go to school. And then they said, well, we care about our employees. Uh, How does this translate into our care for, you know, customers? And that translates into the cleanliness of, uh, and the customer service. They have the best customer service of any fast food uh, company. And then it even goes to, well, what kind of food are we serving our customers? And then, um, you know, then removing antibiotics from their, from their chicken. And now even going where they're going to 
start having care for the animals themselves and start only serve cage-free, um, you know, eggs and chicken in their places. And they're rolling that out over like the next, I think, seven years. Then all of those things are really hard, but I think they all cascade and they all start and they all rest on the foundation of the Sabbath. Again, another topic that resonates in mine and my wife's life, uh, there is a Chick-fil-A uh, on the route that we normally take. When we take her to work, uh, Chick-fil-A is halfway between here and, and where we're going. And, and I found myself a few times thinking, why is the parking lot empty? Oh, it's a Sunday. Uh, because that stands out because most of the time, no matter what time of day it is, their drive through is always busy Monday through Saturday. So when there's nothing there, it, it really catches your eye. And I found myself a time or two thinking, well, I wish they were open today. And yeah, then, everybody's it, had that thought. And I can tell you is that with Chick-fil-A, it's like, you know, wow, if they're really going to be strict on the Sabbath, I bet they're going to be pretty strict on cleanliness, the customer service and the quality of their food. Yeah. Exactly. And you know they're, they're not going to cheat on that because it rests on principles. And every time I've thought, I wish they were open on Sunday, a second or two later, I think, wow, I'm glad they're not open on Sunday. Because let's look at another case to where uh, Black Friday, and it, it used to be to where Thanksgiving, you had a four-day weekend that was rest, and, and now... Places are starting to open early on Thanksgiving Day. It was just Black Friday. Now it's moved all the way up to early on Thanksgiving Day. And, and that kind of fits the same pattern. Yeah, it, 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 the other big part of my goal of the book is that when you have a day where you're not working and you're not running around like a madman, you know, trying to fit this in your schedule and that in your schedule is just really taking time. And you start asking yourself, it's hard not to ask yourself some big questions, some important questions. And some of them may be very difficult. How am I living my life? What's a priority in my life? Am I, am I living my life the right way? What do I believe in? What's my relationship to God? What's my relationship with my parents or my spouse? Some of those may be uncomfortable for some people. But if you don't wrestle with those questions, if you don't face those questions, work on them, what kind of life are you living? The bottom line is the spiritual benefit and what are the physical responses of taking a heartbreak? So the, the physical responses, I can tell you, is um, for me, about 18 hours, normally on the afternoon of my Sabbath, I just have this total sense of relief where I'm just like, I'm not work Aaron, I'm not responsible to all these people, I don't have all these things I'm running around doing, I'm just Aaron. And, and you know, being able to really, you know, just take that stress off and not feel like I have to respond to every email, text, or notification. It's just I feel the stress in my body going down. And there's a lot of uh, studies that show that, you know, there's a marker of stress in your system called cortisol. And they find that it takes about a day for stress in your system, that cortisol, to slowly dissipate. So you think you have a really stressful week, you have a real stressful Friday. It's taking too bad almost the, ne the end of the next day for that to get out of your system. And if you're staying on your phone, if you're connected and you're still working, it never goes away. And the latest research is showing that that cortisol, that stress, that leads to inflammation. And the inflammation is now what they believe leads to all the deadly diseases that you know people die from. And to finish off with the, the thoughts on uh, the benefits, you got to figure if God worked six days and took a day off, that surely man should follow the perfect example. No, I totally agree. So, you know, this is the thing I was thinking about the other day is 
like how arrogant are we that you know you have someone like you get not someone but you, you have god who creates the world the heaven and the universe and yet he needs a break but we don't <laughs> that is pretty it's arrogant just silly. it's just completely silly when you think about it share with us if you will aaron what's your website social media those kind of things theheartbreak.com mm -hmm. is my website uh, you can find me on Facebook at Aaron M. Edelheit, author of The Hard Break. I'm also on Twitter. It's Aaron Value, A-A-R-O-N Value. It's my handle. And you can find my book on Amazon, a Kindle or Harkin. Well, we appreciate you sharing with us. And as always, we end in a word of prayer. Would you join me in prayer? Sure. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, and we thank you for the topic of the book that we've discussed. We just mentioned that God himself worked for six days and then took a rest on the seventh. Help us to learn from that example. Help us to learn from the, uh, the ideas and the research that Aaron put into his book here, The Hard Break the case for the 24-6 lifestyle. Thank you for what that means. We ask a blessing upon Aaron and his life. We ask a blessing upon his family. And Father, we're just thankful that we've crossed paths and help us to use the time that we've spent together to assist people, to inspire people, to do the right thing, and to let their body rest. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and we pray in the name of all things good. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much. That was a beautiful prayer. And thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm trying to spread the positive benefits of the Sabbath, and I really appreciate you well, having uh, me on. And as I mentioned to you off the air, I've been given this a, a lot of thought prior to uh, being introduced to you and your book, and uh, so thank you for your help in that way. I appreciate it. Thanks so much.